Let's take a look at surface tension and arrive at the surprising result that the Gibbs energy of a particle depends on its size, which has real implications for nanoscience and the formation of new phases. Let's start with surface tension. We want to calculate the work associated with creating a, a certain area of surface. We're going to do this constant pressure and temperature. And for a change in surface area, dA, there will be a certain change in the Gibbs energy, dg. And the coefficient that relates the two is gamma, the surface tension. Now the surface tension ends up generating a force, and this force is acting inward on the drop. And this is what maintains the spherical shape of a drop. A, a drop attains a spherical shape because a sphere is the uh, object that has the smallest surface area per unit volume, right? And so a system, of course, evolves to minimize its Gibbs energy. So it's, the system is trying to minimize how much surface area is formed. Hence, a drop is spherical with a radius r. Now the force generated by the surface tension is given here by this formula, 8 pi gamma, the surface tension, times r. The force acts normal to the drop's surface. At equilibrium, all forces balance, right? They have to be equal. And let's remember that pressure is a force per unit area. Therefore, we can relate pressure and force to each other. And the pressures inside and the outside of the drop, well, they've got to be different because there's this extra force that has been added to the system through surface tension. Now at equilibrium again, the surface tension force along with the pressures all must balance. The, the forces from the outside have to balance the forces from the inside. We can write those down again. Pressure being force per unit area, we multiply by the area over which the pressure acts. And we can solve that then for this formula, the inner pressure differs from the outer pressure because of this extra term involving the surface tension and the radius of the particle. And the smaller the radius, the greater the pressure difference between the inside and the outside is. So what are these pressures we're talking about? We're talking about the vapor pressure, right? If you go to a table of vapor pressures, that is the thermodynamic value of the vapor pressure, that's the vapor pressure measured above a planar surface, a surface with R of infinity, where this term goes away and the inner and outer pressures are the same. The equilibrium vapor pressure from tables is for a planar surface. But if we make a drop and have a curved interface from our drop with a radius of R, then there's going to be an elevated vapor pressure experienced by the molecules inside the droplet. And they will therefore evaporate more easily than molecules that have a flat interface in front of them. So let's relate the vapor pressure to the molar Gibbs energy of that vapor at normal conditions, right? So we'll use the star to indicate a normal, pure substance. GM star is the Gibbs, molar Gibbs energy of our vapor, and it's equal to the standard state molar Gibbs energy, G naught, plus a little correction factor here, RT ln P star, the normal vapor pressure, divided by P naught. P naught is the standard pressure of one bar. Now let's compare this to the molar Gibbs energy at some arbitrary pressure, i.e. the pressure inside our little drop, P. In a drop, the molar Gibbs energy is again equal to G naught, the standard molar Gibbs energy, plus RT ln P over P naught, P being the vapor pressure inside the drop. Now the change brought about by forming this curved interface, so we'll take the drop minus the normal here, delta G will be equal to RT ln P, the vapor pressure inside the drop, divided by P star, the, vapor, the normal vapor pressure behind a flat interface. This difference here between those, what we see is that the change in Gibbs energy 
is a function of the curvature, right? And that curvature is a function of the size of the particle. This change of the Gibbs energy is a function of the size of the particle. That's known as the Gibbs-Thompson effect, right? The vapor pressure inside a droplet is different than that inside or behind a flat interface. Now, another way to express the change in molar Gibbs energy as a function of pressure, right, is that we can look at the fundamental equation, right, and that will tell us how the Gibbs energy changes in response to changes in pressure and temperature. Well, we're doing this at constant temperature, so the temperature term will drop out, and we only have to consider the molar volume times dp and integrate over that. If we have an incompressible liquid, we can consider Vm to be constant, we pull it out of the integral, and we can very simply integrate to find the change in Gibbs energy is equal to the molar volume times delta P. Now delta P, we know what that is, right? We, can, uh, we have already developed an equation for how the inner pressure is different from the outer pressure based on the size of our drop. And delta P is just the inner pressure minus the outer pressure. That's equal to two gamma over R. Now we'll equate the right hand sides of these two equations here, equation one and equation two, and we'll substitute for delta P from the relationship between P inner, P outer, the surface tension and R from up here, and that will allow us to derive the Kelvin equation. Because the Gibbs energy is a function of curvature and therefore the size of the particles, also the equilibrium vapor pressure of a particle depends on its size. The vapor pressure within a drop is equal to the normal vapor pressure times this exponential term. A droplet is a sphere of liquid surrounded by a fluid. R is its radius, and that's positive. We can also apply this equation to bubbles, where we have a sphere of gas surrounded by a liquid, or maybe a membrane, right? And then R is actually negative in those cases. It works for both, but we're concentrating on the drops here. Big conclusion, right? droplets in contact with their vapor, the liquid inside the droplet has a higher vapor pressure than normal, and that vapor pressure increases with decreasing size. This becomes really important when we hit the nanoscale, right? Large deviations start to be found when we get to about 100 nanometers and below. Let's take the case of water at 300 Kelvin to make this uh, a little more concrete, right? When we get to 100 nanometer particles, we get a 1% change between the vapor pressure within the droplet and the, vape, the normal vapor pressure. As the particle gets smaller, the deviations get bigger. That's about 10% at 10 nanometers, and it's almost a factor of three by the time we get to a one nanometer droplet. The implications of this are actually quite large in a number of regions. And this leads to the phenomenon that we know as Oswald ripening. So let's um, assume that we've got some small droplets and some large droplets in our sample. Say it's something like a cloud that's trying to form and we got some small drops and we got some big drops. What's going to happen? Well, the small drops, we've, we've got a liquid in equilibrium with the vapor phase, so all the time there are molecules going back and forth between the liquid and the gas. And if diffusion can take molecules from the gas phase and between these particles, well, the small particles have higher vapor pressure than the larger particles. And the system wants to try to minimize its Gibbs energy, and the way it can do this is to transfer matter from the less stable particles to the more stable particles. So as a function of time, we'll see the small particles get smaller, and the large particles get larger, and the small particles get smaller yet, 
until eventually all the small particles go away and just large particles are left over. And when the diffusion length becomes less than the distance between the particles, the size distribution will stop changing. That process of the size distribution attaining its final state, that's what we call Ostwald ripening. So the molar Gibbs energy of a droplet depends on its size. That leads to the Gibbs-Thompson effect, and we derived the Kelvin equation as well, which we see has important implications for the size distribution of particles and that large particles grow at the expense of small particles.